we have to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing to be great because you are the youth and you are the ones that are going to change Africa. You youth have to be better and you guys are the ones that have to change the world for us. And you guys are going to be better basketball players, but most importantly, you're going to be better human beings. To understand Masai Ujiri is to know the colleagues around him, the leaders who've inspired him, and the friends he's grown alongside. See, the journey that Masai has taken follows a path of unified strength, where the triumphs of one encourage and empower the dreams of many, because a thriving community is the real reward. From the age of 13, Masai fueled his passion for basketball on the Amadou Bello University Courts in Zaria, near his northern Nigeria homestead. It was on these proving grounds where his resilience and talents would begin to shine through. Young Masai's hunger and drive would take him around the world, 7,500 miles from home, in a new country, with a different culture and a much colder climate. But wherever he landed, the ties he had built back home remained. And after six years in numerous countries, Masai decided to move off the court and into the front office. First as the junior national coach of Nigeria, then as an unpaid scout with the Orlando Magic, before finally landing a position with the Denver Nuggets. Despite the long nights and sacrifices, Masai's NBA dreams had finally become a reality. All the while, Masai continued assisting the Basketball Without Borders program, pairing international standouts with NBA stars and coaches. And just as they lived and breathed basketball on the courts of Zaria, Masai and his friends continued to bring opportunities to youth through the Giants of Africa initiative they co-founded in 2003, teaching life skills, speaking on women's rights issues, and providing leadership to countless incredible youth in a growing number of countries. The award-winning Giants of Africa documentary followed Masai and his team through the many struggles and successes evident along the way. Masai would flourish as a top executive with the Toronto Raptors before moving back to the Denver Nuggets in 2010, becoming the first African general manager in the history of the NBA. He completed high-pressure deals, increased wins, and drafted a wealth of talented recruits, earning himself the NBA Executive of the Year Award in 2013. Welcome home. So happy to see you. This is unbelievable, huh? This is unbelievable, man. Wow, oh, God, that was unbelievable, man. On June 4th of that same year, Masai Ujiri was announced as the new president and general manager of the Toronto Raptors. The next five years would become the most successful tenure in franchise history, earning a record number of wins each year, retaining their all-star core tandem, and drafting a plethora of powerful young players with unlimited potential. The dream of a championship has never been this close. Masai has been instrumental in changing the culture to a winning and community-first mentality, highlighting the We the North campaign, mobilizing the whole country behind Canada's team, the Toronto Raptors. On a national scale, partnering with Canadian Prime Minister and friend Justin Trudeau, Masai helped comfort and engage the students of the 2016 Balazs, Saskatchewan tragedy. Addressing social issues and fostering change at home, Masai teamed up with Toronto rapper Drake for the recent Welcome Toronto initiative, refurbishing community basketball courts across the city in marginalized communities. To truly understand Masai is to know that family, community, and team all grow together and the triumphs of one can empower the dreams of many. There's no greater gift than paying it forward, and we all must dream big. NBA, we are coming! NBA, we are happy! Africa, we are happy! Africa, we are happy! We are happy! Please welcome the president of the Toronto Raptors NBA team, director of Basketball Without Borders, and founder, Giants of Africa, Masai Ujiri.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. With the lighting, I can't see as much there. Everybody looks so beautiful with all the African clothes. It's okay, we you. you see me? <laughs> wow. This has always been my dream uh, to speak uh, to, to people like this, to youth like this. And um, first of all, I want to thank the, the State uh, Department uh, for for having me here. Um, it, it's an honor, especially following uh, the footsteps of uh, some of the people that have been here. Um, I also want to thank um, and oh, acknowledge uh, Nelson Mandela. 100 years of Nelson Mandela. It's so, so important, so important uh, that we remember him in an unbelievable way, I think. Um, I was opportune to meet Nelson Mandela um, a few years ago. And maybe I, should, maybe I should start off that way. Seven of us were chosen. I had to go meet him in South Africa during our Basketball Without Borders camp. And um, I remember walking into the room and I was almost scared, nervous. I know what an icon you are going to meet. And he walks out. Uh, after we had been there for about uh, five, ten minutes. And I was lucky <laughs> to be standing next to Dikembe Mutombo. And he walks up to Mutombo. And at the time, I think everybody knows how great and what work Dikembe Mutombo has done in the continent of Africa, in the hospital he built. And he walks up to Dikembe. And he says to him, um, what a great thing you are doing for your people in Africa. Don't ever stop. And he gave me chills. And at the time, I was a scout. <laughs> I wish I knew what that meant. <laughs> it was my first year in the NBA. And yes, I was just a scout. And to stand right there with Dikembe Mutombo, seven foot three or seven foot two, and Nelson Mandela, and to see these great people, I said to myself, I want to aspire to do something small, to do something for the youth of Africa. And I promised myself, as I, as I continued to get more opportunity and it continued to drive me, that I would do as much as I could um, for the youth of Africa. The other person I want to acknowledge here is a hero, he's a friend, he's a son of the continent. I was just with him in the, on the continent of Africa a couple weeks ago. It's President Obama. I think what these two men have done is they've called on us. They've called on us and they've said to us 
that we can be great. And you guys can do whatever, whatever you decide you want to do in life. We have to aspire. So I'll introduce myself. My name is Masai Nijiri, and I'm proud to say that I grew up in a small town in Nigeria called Zaria. Yeah! yeah. I want you guys to understand this, okay? I want you guys to really, really understand this. I didn't grow up here, okay? Just like many of you, I grew up in Africa, in real Africa. Many of you know uh, some of the perceptions now um, with what's going on in northern Nigeria. And it's what makes me want to believe and what should make us believe in life, okay? Because I grew up in northern Nigeria and I had the best childhood ever, okay? Our problems are not religious, they're not. Yeah. Not even close, okay? I say it with great pride. Yeah, I grew up with Muslims, I grew up with Christians. Yeah, and I grew up with loving people. And I'm proud of that, okay? So let's not ever think that our problems are religious. Our problems start with us and the perception we give the world, right? And that's why we depend on you youth. Because I'm telling you, I was just like you, just like you. You work, you believe, you be good to people, you strive, you're positive, and you keep working. So, I'm not going to stand here and tell you of any accomplishments or anything that um, I, I, I don't think that um, should be part of the agenda here. I'm here to tell you guys that I once sat in your shoes and the MBA, maybe some people don't know what the MBA is. The MBA is the basketball league. I'm sure you guys know Michael Jordan, you know LeBron James, you know all these players. Kobe Bryant. <laughs> so I work, I work for the Toronto Raptors. And I'm blessed to be the president of the Toronto Raptors. Every time some people write my story, they, they say I'm the first African um, in all of um, sports in North America uh, to be in a position like this. And honestly, I don't see that as prideful. You know why? I'll tell you why. If there's no other Africans that follow after me, then I'm a failure. Wow. Yeah? More have to come. Yeah, they have to be more. 
not just basketball, in other sports. Yes. In other sports, we have to be. We have to aspire. And maybe I can just be an example. And maybe I can just be a leader. Maybe I can be an inspiration, some way, somehow. But I don't want to be the first. I don't want to be the last. I want more Africans to come. So when the NBA gave me this huge opportunity, and I said, from scout to international scout, to director of scouting, uh, to director of global scouting, to assistant GM, to GM, to president. I feel the, <laughs> I hear you well, well. <laughs> Everybody thinks they know Sabi broken English. Are all blind. I'll be back. I continue broken English. <laughs> Don't make all these things fake you now. <laughs> uh, but when the NBA gave me an opportunity, um, it put the weight on my shoulder. And the weight on my shoulder, honestly, is not the pressure of my job. The pressure of my job is easy. I don't feel any pressure. And God has blessed me that way. I'm really lucky. I remember when I was playing in Belgium and we were in the playoffs and we were playing a, playing a lower seed and one of my friends from Congo, at the time there was the war in Congo, he said, uh, a journalist asked him, you guys feel the pressure that you could lose to this team? And he said, pressure. What is pressure? And he told a story. And he said, I have an uncle back in the Congo. He has 13 kids. Doesn't have a job. His wife has AIDS. They all live in one little room. And his kids are aged from four months to 18 years old. He doesn't know how he's going to feed them every day. That's pressure. That's pressure right there. I have two kids. I want to feed them every day. I want to work for them every day. That's pressure. Not what we do. Not basketball. That's not pressure. That's fun. So I'm blessed. God has blessed me to have a job that's basically almost a hobby. It's something that I dreamt about on those outdoor courts in Zaria when I was 13 years old. And that's why when the NBA has given me this opportunity, I must go back and give other youth opportunity. So that's how I started Giants of Africa. 
And it started from my old coach, Oliver Johnson, in Amadou Bello University in Zaria. And I remember him doing basketball camps. And as a scout, I wanted to do basketball camps in Nigeria. <clears throat> My goal was to find the next Akim Olajuwon, or the next Dikembe Mutombo, or the next Serge Ibaka, or the next Luol Deng. After I had done the camps for a few years, I found out that only one or two or three of those kids make the MBA. So what happens to the others? Yeah, what happens to the other kids? And my mind was so into finding talent and into impressing my bosses. I found this guy, or oh, this guy has a chance. I started to think about the younger ones, the other ones, the ones that are not so talented. What happened to them in the camps, after the camps? And that's why I started to concentrate on life skills and leadership and inspiring those other kids so that they can use basketball as a passion, use sports as a passion, and milk it, and milk it, and milk it until you find your niche through sports in life. That's the only way I learned. I found my niche through sports. I want to teach these kids that sports is very underrated. All of you now know, when we were growing up, go to school, go to class. My mom pulled my ear so much. <laughs> you can tell, Abby. <laughs> Especially this left one here. <laughs> The Western world is a great teacher for us. So what the State Department, or what Barack Obama, or what Nelson Mandela initiated for us is a true lesson for you guys. Because I'm challenging you guys. Why don't we have the MBA in Africa? Why don't we have arenas in Africa? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Through sports, I started to think that we can teach these kids. They can play basketball and become sports journalists, sports psychologists, sports lawyers. We can use these arenas like they use arenas here to have concerts, to do different things in our sports arenas. So instead of going back home and being critical and say, why is the government not doing this? And why is the government not doing that? We all want to voice our own opinion. I pointed at myself and I said, what am I doing? Yeah. Instead of going and talking all the talking, what am I doing? Yes, and all of us need to stop that. Yeah. 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 As soon as Buhari does something or presidents do something or somebody does something, we're the first to type and criticize, right? Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, we all have to ask ourselves, especially you guys as youth, because you have an opportunity. 
you have an opportunity to create change in an unbelievable continent, okay, that has growth, that has resources, that has land, that has smart people, that has geniuses, that has great, great opportunity everywhere. And so in my mind, I decided that I could go to my mom's country. My mom is from Kenya. This, this, is, this is the time where I'll speak Swahili, but unfortunately, I can't brag with that one. <laughs> uh, Abariyaku. <laughs> I took the Maasai name. So, I went to Kenya and did the same camp. And I went to Rwanda. And I went to Ghana. And we went to Senegal. We went to Botswana. We went to Uganda. We went to Tanzania. And guess what? It's not as hard as we think to travel in Africa. And it's not as hard to go work in other countries, especially if you bring good. In my mind, when I was working in Nigeria with these camps, I used to think, man, how difficult is it going to be to go to these other countries? And in Africa, we're just welcoming people. Yes, and you go to Uganda and they welcome you. You go to Tanzania and they welcome you. Everywhere you go on the continent, you are welcomed. So why can't we do it more? So giving back has become part of me. I want to tell you guys that you don't have to get to a certain position to give back. Because I remember when I was working for the Denver Nuggets and I wanted shoes, I told the players and they put a bin in front of the locker room, in the middle of the locker room. And Carmelo Anthony, Kenya Martin, Chancey Billups, all these guys threw shoes in there for me to take back to Africa. One day, Marcus Camby came to me, a former player, and said, you know, I have a deal with N1 shoes. Why don't I, instead of collecting all these shoes, why don't I give you N1, N, uh, uh, a couple of N1 shoes? One day I got back home and there were all these cartons waiting for me outside my house. And he had sent me a hundred pairs of shoes to take back home. And back in the day when I used to do my camp, I'd have coaches travel to Africa with me. And so I'll send them each a box of shoes, a couple boxes, so they carry it to Nigeria. And then when we get to Nigeria, we start worrying about which luggage came and which one did not come. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I we even started talking about clearing custom here too for the one that came. <laughs> and so we had our N1 shoes. My boss at the time, Kiki Vandeweghe, my, my GM at the time, he told our equipment manager to get me the cheapest cheapest jerseys that you can get. And I'll take them back to Nigeria. And there was the camp. I had my coaches, 
add my jerseys, and add my shoes. And we taught the kids. And we took pictures. And those pictures, you now send to Nike, you now send to Reebok, and you now send to N1. And then somebody gets inspired a little bit by the tall kids they see. And then Reebok called me and they said, we'll give you a three-year deal and we'll supply you with the gear that you want. And every s summer, they'd ship it to my house. I have the same issue. <laughs> Send in back. <laughs> but the colors became brighter and brighter and brighter. And then Nike saw that. And Nike gave me another deal. And they said, you know what we'll do? We'll ship it for you. Yeah. And that's how it begins to grow. Yeah, slowly, it starts to grow. It starts to grow. Now Nike does not only send them to me, they supply us in Kenya, they supply us in Nigeria, they supply us in Senegal, and anywhere we want to go on the continent of Africa. Togo. After this session, we'll talk about which countries we want to go to. But you begin to build, and you begin to build, and it's my appeal to you that even if it's something small you do in whatever field you work, whether it's helping your neighbor or your little sister or your little brother or your friend or an organization, it's important you grow that way because giving back and giving is part of what we do and is part of our culture and it should be part of a culture of the world. It would make the world such a better place to live in. It's important that we understand that as people and it's important that in you understand that in the stages of where you are. Okay? Everybody wants to be a leader. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. We have to find some followers. You can become a leader from being a great follower. And whoever you follow, be good at it. Okay? Be very good at it because it will help you. I know that one of the things that helped me was I showed more passion than ambition. Yeah, because some of us get to this point where you're, oh, I want to be this, 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 and you actually like forget the passion of what you are doing. Yeah, you, we forget it. I want to be this, I want to be this. You, you get so into it. Yeah. You, when you have the passion of what you really want to do and what you are doing, I'm telling you, you will get to where you want to go. Yeah. If you put your heart in it, if you put everything in it, you will get there. And I'm telling you that I'm the prime example of this. I'm telling you this. Because it works. 
It absolutely works for everyone. I'm going to go to some of the people that have inspired me. And sometimes, yes, I will mention the people that I've read about that really, really inspire me. But I want to start with one thing that's underrated in this world, and I hate that it's underrated. Women. <laughs> Everything women touch turns to gold. My four-year-old daughter inspires me. Yeah, she inspires me. Because when I look at her, and then I look at where I was born, and I look at some of the things that young women and young girls go through, I know she is blessed. But in her eyes, I know one day she's going to go and help others. My mother, our mothers. Okay, when we're talking about women, let me cut through the bullshit here. Oh, excuse me. Let me cut through it. <laughs> is there anybody, does anybody, if anybody can give me the, uh, if anybody can give me an instance here, okay? Is there anybody in this world that did not come from a woman? Is there anybody? That should tell us everything. I remember when I was playing in Europe, I had played and played until my salary was going like this. <laughs> that means I can't play. That means you can't play when your salary is going the other way. <laughs> <laughs> and I started looking at myself and thinking like, okay, professional basketball is not paying off for me. What should I be doing next? And I went and told my mom that I wanted to come back to America and I wanted to be a college coach. And she told me um, to come meet her the next morning. And she walked me to the precinct in Portsmouth in England. And she was working there at the time. And she took me to this suit shop. And she had saved up money to buy me two suits. two suits, and she said, you're going to need this. You're going to need these suits. I'll never forget them. I still have them. I try to be fly with my suits now. She bought me those baggy suits at the time, but I still have it, <laughs> and trim it up a little bit. <laughs> the thought of the mother is unbelievable. So you see these people that inspire you all the time. I remember when I got the first call to interview um, for the general manager's position in Denver. And I was in Senegal at the time at Basketball Without Borders. And there was a rumor going around that the general manager had already been chosen. And that the interview process was just to go through it. 
and I told my wife I'm not going. The person has already been chosen. And she looked at me and she said, have you ever interviewed for a GM job before? <laughs> and I said, no. And she said, why not go? I had also worked for the Denver Nuggets before as a scout. And I had moved to Toronto as assistant GM. And this was Denver wanting to interview me. She asked me, didn't you work for the Nuggets before? Don't you know the owners? And I said, yes. Believe me, in my mind, I wasn't going to go for that interview. Because in our industries, we read and we see and we have these perceptions and we have these things ingrained in our heads that this is how it is. And a lot of times, it's not how it is. We just put it in our own heads and believe in nonsense. Why not go there and prove yourself? And you know what? If it doesn't work, you have the experience. I went there, and by the grace of God, I got the job. And so I look at a lot of places in my life that have been inspired by women. And it goes underrated. It's never talked about. We have to talk about it more. Yeah, we have to. To empower women, especially in the continent of Africa, we have to talk about it more. You youth have to talk about it. When you go back to wherever you're from, when you go back to your communities, go talk about it. Don't let anybody oppress you. Talk about it. Because women are strong. And when I look at how I grew up with my sisters and friends and how they inspired me and how they helped me, we have to. We have to. We have no other choice in Africa. I'm telling you, it will make us rise. I'm also inspired by our history in Africa. I'm inspired by Kwame Nkrumah. I'm inspired by Jomo Kenyatta. I'm inspired by Thomas Sankara. Read more, OK? Read more about Africa. Read more about Africa. It's really, really important for us. I'm inspired by Nelson Mandela. I'm inspired by Barack Obama. I'm inspired by Paul Kagame. Because in the 21st century, we need visionaries. We need you guys to see ahead, OK? Because I'll tell you now, 
Africa is now. I believe in next generation Africa, but I'm telling you Africa is now. And Africa must win. We must win in everything that we do. You youth, you guys must win, okay? I'll leave you with this, okay? Every time I drive home, I pinch myself. I really do. I think about people. If I talk to people in the right way, if I talk to people in the in not so right way. And that's why you guys have to have lessons. Okay? You guys have to have lessons. Set goals. Okay? Set goals. Money should not be a priority, okay? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a priority, okay? Help others. Make sure you help others. Bring other people along as you go. Make sure you do that. Have mentors, like I talked about. Find mentors, find people that inspire you, that can mentor you, that can guide you in the right way. It's really important. And the last, one of the things I said before is show more passion than ambition. Because every day on that ride home at the end, I ask myself, and I wonder, why did God choose me? And you know what I discovered? God chose every single one of us. Every single one of us and every single one in this room is special. He's given you something that you must grow with. You must find that niche and you must be something. God bless you all. I think we have like five minutes for questions and answers. Am I right or wrong? Okay, here we go. Hi, okay. Uh, my name is Naya. I am from Madagascar, yeah. and I have been placed in Appalachian State University during the five weeks. So. Um, I am a Girl Scout, and I love basketball. So um, I, I, I do fi find that in you, in your path. And I, I, I think that you are lucky enough to have your passion and your work both mixed. But I mean, in Africa, in the, where I came from, when there is an athlete and he's or she's good at it, we, have, we face challenges like the retention of expertise when they are good at the sport, they went abroad to perform because, you know, at the local level, they don't have much opportunities to perform well. So that's why I think that is my the reason why they went abroad. So I, I want to find out what is your strategy to, re to have retention expertise at the national level? And what approach do you have to really like make the community accept that the sport is a really good way to, to for youth empowerment and 
it really empowers young people because where I came from, it's really hard to pursue people that this sport can really is really good for your development, both personal and professional development. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so, um, for me, I tell all the youth is be the best that you can possibly be. Yes. So if I'm here, I want to be the best in this room. And I'm telling you, if you are the best female scout, you will succeed. Yes, you will find talent and you will be great. But while you are doing it nationally, you have to, you have to be the best and you have to make a difference. It's so important. And so what do we need in Africa? We need courts, we need leadership, we need infrastructure, we need coaches, okay? We have to grow all those things. And that's why I asked the question of how much are we doing nationally where we are? Do something that's going to stand out to me, all that era of coming here or doing all those things is gone. Well, Africa is ripe enough. Africa is good enough now. Where are those leagues? Where are the influential people that we know that can help build a court in the secondary school that my kid goes to or start a Sunday league? Those are the little steps that we have to take I think that to continue to grow. And we will come to Madagascar. <laughs> Tell me, sir. Okay, Amen. my name is Buba Karsi, and uh, I am from Mali. Uh, I'm very happy to hear from you because you are really inspiring. And I've been working in sport. I used to say that I'm in sport by destiny because I used to be a teacher and then I've been involving in sport by organizing sport even in a community school. Then now I'm working uh, with an international sport organization uh, as a trainer and community sport coach. Um, so sometimes I think it's good to start a business in sport field in Africa mm. so we can produce our own ball, our own jerseys. Because that's something we really need. Because most of the time, those coaches don't have both for their kids. That's most of the challenge they are facing. And we are always waiting both to come from other country. Sometimes it takes time. And as we are like with entrepreneur, young entrepreneurs here, I would like to invite people to start thinking about something like that start a business where we can produce our own materials. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Amina Isado. I come from Niger. Uh, not Nigeria. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I used to play basketball. I don't have any comment, but please come in Niger. We have many talent there. Thank you. We will. Welcome. Can I come to this side? Tell me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kendora Badzigi. I am from Chad. I love basketball. Actually, I'm a basketball player. I have my younger brother who is 2 meters, 0 0.5. And he's taller than me, actually. I used to play basketball in Arizona. I am also from... I study in Amadou Bolo University. Mm -hmm. When you, you introduce yourself, I was like, you are my man. <laughs> so we are from the same place. My question is that you talked earlier about like, having our own NBA in Africa. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that will be a great idea because we have tall people in Africa and we have like <laughs> talented people in basketball in Africa. But I, I, I used to think they are, they are of no use. You see tall people that they don't play basketball, they are just walking around. <laughs> so we, why not? Ha so my, my question is that we should consider it. And what do you think it is a good idea? What are the strategy for us to have our, our own NBA in Africa? Thank you. That's a, it's a good question. So put your hands down first. Let me answer that question because it's a challenge. It's a challenge for us. It's what I challenged in, in Nigeria. I go to the national stadium and I hold the basketball camps there every year, okay? And the national stadium is an ISO, okay? It's been that same way. It's been the same way since I was 18 years old and I'm 550 years old right now. <laughs> and it's been the same way. How can it be? How can it be? So what we're talking about, example is, the NBA goes and we hold the game in South Africa. In fact, I'm flying to South Africa at 5.30 today. Okay? They hold the game in South Africa. Why? Because we're struggling with, you think the NBA does not want to go all over the continent? But tell me what arenas that we can use in other countries. That's the issue we have. And when we do, it's what I told you guys about following, and everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, and everybody wants to be a leader, but there are no people that manage these places. There are no, there are no anybody, there's not, there's not many people that cater for these places. So they build all these stadiums and they are run down within a couple years. Why? Why? So here is what I'm saying. All of you, that's your challenge. Go make a difference. Go make a difference. Find people that are going to maintain. Find people that are going to build those arenas so that the NBA can come. It's very important, guys, that you take this serious, okay? It's very important that you take this serious because some of you that say you're in sports and you have influences in different little places, this is the encouragement that the youth need. Okay, so... We go to the stadium, and they use the same stadium for church. They use it for uh, uh, wedding. They use it for naming ceremony. They use it for, is it not? Why? Right here. I can hold it, yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Mohammed Ahmed. I was I did my fellowship in Drexel University. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from Nigeria. I have a way of finding the Nigerians when I'm pointing at them. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically Gombe State, mm -hmm. close to Zaria where you grew up. So I was very happy when you mentioned your experience in the northern Nigeria, talking about uh, extremism, religion, culture, and you mentioned that is actually not part of the problem we have. And I'm going to ask you, what are you doing specifically using your sport camps to bring these youths that are obviously being uh, drawn into extreme behaviors uh, involved in violent activities, drug abuse, and other social meanings. That's one. And my second question, and is also an appeal to you, um, 
we as fellows from the northern part of Nigeria are actually working very closely now to organize a youth camp so that we can be able to bring out our brothers from the hoods who are unfortunately being used by politicians and other uh, extreme-minded people to uh, engage them into extreme behaviors and violence, drug abuse, and others. We, I want a recommendation from you because we don't know the age group that we should target. Either it should be people at the high school level or the youth that are already in the universities, or should we go for the kindergarten because the problem actually flows across. We don't know where should we start. Thank you. That's a great question. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, for me, if I use the example of when I was young, um, I found basketball, I found football, and we have, to, we have to encourage this on a youth level, and it has to be primary schools. Yeah, you have to start these kids when they are younger and encourage sports. I agree what my guy said from Zaria. He said, there are so many tall people walking around. <laughs> You guys remember many years ago, many, many years ago. Uh, just think about this. Many, many years ago, okay? They would invite Stephen Keshi to come and play football for Nigeria. And there was only one or two. In fact, if you guys are historians, you remember, or soccer, uh, sports historian, you remember uh, Oparaji, who died on the soccer field in Nigeria. There was one or two professionals, okay, that they would bring to come and play for Nigeria. That was 25, 30 years ago, okay? Now, you can make a Nigerian national team in Real Madrid alone. You can make a Nigerian national team in Belgium. You can make a Nigerian national team in England. You can make a Nigerian national team anywhere, right? Yeah, so where did all these soccer players come from? <coughs> now we have how many countries from Africa in the World Cup? Yeah? Yeah. Including France. Including France. <laughs> yeah, including France, right? So... So what I'm trying to say to you is it's the same way in every sport and it's the same way in basketball, okay? They are walking around everywhere and all we need is facilities. And what all these clubs did is they came and built academies and the business of football started to grow in Africa. And they started to recognize all the talents. And that comes to your question is we have to start in the primary schools. Okay, I, as soon as I came out of my mom's womb, there was a soccer ball waiting for me. <laughs> so I can play soccer very easily. Okay, I started playing basketball when I was 13 and I became pretty good at it, but I didn't start at the young age that they start in America. Because you can go, if you walk outside this place, I bet you there's like three gyms around here where you, or three outdoor courts where you can play. So you have to go and encourage these kids from playing in facilities. As I told you, religion is not the po problem. Poverty is the problem. Yes. Yes, it's poverty. Yeah, let's all be real with ourselves. It's not religion. Okay? Once we begin to feed and once we begin to give, you see them go away from all these extra things, because the same problems are the same problems all over the world. Whether you go to hoods in Chicago, whether you go to hoods in Zaria, whether you go to poor places in anywhere in the world, that's the issue. Right here. Hopefully she's not Nigerian. 
Hi, my name is Kahiso Mapalle from South Africa. I was doing my civic leadership track at the presidential precinct. Um, you mentioned a long list of males who um, inspire you, and in the era now of women empowerment, for example, Nelson Mandela's legacy was kept alive by Winnie Mandela when he was in prison. <laughs> we have a lot of girl children in Africa who need to have women who have done a lot to be raised up so that they can look up to them. Mm -hmm. So I am going to request you to please, in the same way you gave a long list of male mm -hmm. people who inspire you, to give another list of women in Africa who inspire you, mm -hmm. so that their names can also be raised up. Thank you. I answer that question, I answer that question with all honesty, you know, um, because I really do believe in what she's saying. You know, and um, when I studied with uh, some of the people that helped me with leadership, and um, I have a leadership consultant, I have people that try to help me with, um, with Giants of Africa, and we talked about this. We talked about who are those women, and how do they stand out, okay? And we have to continue to mention them. But I have to be honest in myself, and I'm telling you the women that in inspired me. I, it's my mother. <laughs> my daughter, my wife. I didn't, when I was growing up, and because I was into sports and maybe into history a little bit, I did not, okay, I know a woman that inspired me. Maria Makepa inspired me, yeah, yes. Yvonne Shaka Shaka inspired me. <laughs> Tell me. You are the only Cameroonian here? No. Oh, okay. Oh. I didn't hear anybody. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Aisha Tumanu from Cameroon. I was uh, at presidential press in civil, civil leadership track. Um, I just want to say um, I'm pleading that uh, Cameroon is a great nation of sport. So being uh, your neighbor, we are also urging you to come to Cameroon <laughs> and <laughs> create that STEM uh, uh, institute in our own country because we, need, we also have that talent and we are pleading you to have that partnership with you. Thank you. So with, with, that, with that being said, I want to brag a little bit. So two years ago, we drafted Pascal Siakam from Cameroon, and he's done unbelievable for Toronto Raptors. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> So before saying anything, I want to tell you that my name is Pamela P. Pamela for P, Urshel, U, Mobola D, M, A for Aklogan. So my name is Puma. And yes, and I hope that one day I represent Puma. Yes. I was born for sport, but I didn't know. I started playing basketball when I was nine. Then I played judo. Then I worked as sport journalist. And since I didn't get to anywhere, like I just play once for the national basketball team. I felt like there is nothing for me in sport. Where are you from? I'm from Benin, West Africa. <laughs> I was in Indiana University. I was coming to it. So last year, I got the opportunity to have a job, an international job, and I gave up because I choose my passion. And you were talking about passion. When I took the decision to do what I, I'm doing now, I didn't know that I would come to the Yali and I would meet you. Because when I made that decision, my dream was to meet you and today I'm here and I meet you. God bless you. My dream, my dream was to meet you because when I made the decision to start working in sports, my mother showed me your story. I created my organization and in a year, we reach out to 2,000 girls using sport as a tool to invest in the leadership and their dreams and create safe spaces for them. 
But also we started a campaign for safety on playgrounds because there is a lot of accident in our, on our playground in Benin. And I believe that if we don't have the right environment, we can promote sports in our countries. And I hope that I will influence the government so that they will tell people to stop driving on the playground. And today I got partnership to run plane, to run to run a camp, a camp in my country. And this is the first time that we go buy our materials to run our camps because we were borrowing materials. So my question for you is, how do we get people like you? How do we get organizations like Giants of Africa? How do we get Nike to support our program in Benin? Because if I am the first doing this, I want more in Africa. And I want you to tell us because that is the right question. We are doing a lot and we want people to know that we are doing a lot. So how do we get you to support us. I don't know how to answer that question. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me let me let me tell you let me tell you something. What you are doing is great. And what you are doing is really, really great. Is Don here? Where are you at? Don is our director of uh, Giants of Africa. Make sure you talk to her, okay? <laughs> Let's go to the back a little bit. Okay. Tell uh, me. I'm Antoine and I'm from Liberia. Um, <laughs> I did my fellowship at the Arizona State University. Hearing your story is something that took me back to my country. Between 1989 and 2003, we went through some of the, the worst crises ever. We had this young man who then had the opportunity to play in Europe. He was one of the single Colonel Liberian, who sponsored almost all of our activities whilst we were going through civil crisis. He took our national team personally to play games. Today, this young man, benevolence has paid off. He is our president. You are doing a great job. I am not admonishing you to delve into politics, but I know you can even be more than that. Please continue what you are doing, and Africa is going to be grateful to have you. I thank you. Thank you. Both, we'll come to both of you. Um, my name is Whitney from Austin, Texas University. <laughs> I'm from Mozambique. Well, uh, what I have to say is that it's really nice that you've managed to live your life following your dream. But what happens when you're from a country where you, when you decide to live doing sports or art, they tell you it's a hobby. It's not a real job. I was told the same thing. Yeah, I, I, and I grew up in northern Nigeria, so it's the same challenges. Uh, I understand what you're saying, and I understand that um, yeah, you're a woman, but we all, we all go through the same challenges that we are told that go to school. In my era, in my time, in my generation, it was go to school, sports doesn't do anything for you. I was laughed at for playing basketball. Uh, for, um, for being so passionate about it. But you believe in yourself. You believe in your drive. You believe in what's inside you. Hey, and you hold yourself accountable. You have to hold yourself accountable because I'm telling you, I've grown to this position, but I'm telling you that there have been tough times. There have been hard times. There have been times where I've looked at it and I've said, man, is this thing going to pay off? Or is this thing going to work the way I think it's going to work? We all go through that, all of us. Uh, so you have to persevere, you have to fight. 
and you have to find that light in that tunnel. You have to find it. Everybody you look in here, I know, has gone through hardship one way or the other, or adversity one way or the other. Every single one of us. Uh, you will get it, sir. Um, my name is Joe Legendary from Tanzania. Hey, love y'all. And uh, I went to the University of uh, Texas at Austin. Hook'em. And uh, last year, uh, we met in Tanzania. And we had a little conversation. But fast forward, last week you did an interview about the Kauai um, Lowry trade. Mm -hmm. And you said uh, the craziness about having, balancing the business part with the emotional part. And I run a couple of businesses, and I struggle with the emotional part because sometimes I let it take too much and the business side kind of fails a little. So how do you balance that, especially with you talking about passion so much? Thank you very much. It's a great question. Can everybody put their hands down? Because it's, it's uh, seriously, it's a really, really good question because we all go through it um, wherever you are and whatever you are doing. Because at the end of the day, we're human beings. Yeah, we're human beings. And honestly, I treat every single human being, every single one, like I would want to be treated. And I would treat my own family. And my friends know it, and I know the players know it, and the people I work with know it. And that's the big struggle. That's the big struggle. Because we want to win. Sports is about winning. It's about competing. But it's one thing I struggle with. It's that balance. Because I don't want to break anybody's heart. Yeah, and I don't want to see anybody down. I don't want to see somebody feel not in a very good way. If I was to tell you guys one part of my job that I don't like, that's the part. Yeah, because I have to look at these players in the eyes. We have to conduct trades, we have to conduct business, and we have to cut people. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. And all of you are going to go through it. Every single one of you are going to go through it. Yeah. Last one. He's giving me the red light of stop. Um, hi, I'm Mahlith. I'm from Ethiopia. Um, uh, I did civic leadership. Uh, I did civic leadership at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and my my question is regarding media coverage. Um, we've all seen how Black Panther has changed how Africa is portrayed, and you have a lot of media coverage, and how do you think we can all contribute to make sure that media portrays the realities of youth in Africa? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. We have to stop portraying as much negative and portray great stories that come from Africa. We have to, we have to. Even this day of social media, yeah, instead of being negative one day and type all those weird comments that you have, why can't we promote all the good things that are happening on the continent, even if they are this small? Yeah, even if they are this small. We have to. We have to do that on our continent. It's really important that we do that. Yeah, because I have a voice. The reason I'm here today, the reason I'm here today, honestly, is because you guys inspire me. Yeah, I see myself in you. And I see you guys in myself. And so for media, 
especially in Africa, carry the great stories. Yeah, make them a big deal. Even if it's for a small crowd or a small audience, lift them up. For those young kids, those young programs, those young teams, lift them up. Yeah, tell the story and it'll open our eyes even more. That's why I speak out. Because you know what? I have a voice. Yeah, I have a voice. God has blessed me to be in this position. I have to. It's an obligation that I have to speak up for Africa. I have to speak up for the continent. And the media has to do the same exact thing. Okay? They said that's my time. So God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You guys were awesome. Thank you. <laughs> We'd like to thank all of our speakers this morning and thank you for attending this morning's session. Please join your other fellows for networking reception in the Blue Room and enjoy the rest of your day.